universe or else why are we even doing this? But I don't think I'd cut out with the fun stuff because that to me is the fun stuff. Build that audience because if you've got no one to sell it to then it's just going to flop and die and no one likes a floppy life. I'm yet to meet a woman who just kind of grew up confidently in her body. Welcome to my podcast. I'm Nicole Bromner. Join my weekly conversations with really interesting people as I delve into the stories and experiences that make them uniquely them. Hi, and welcome back to my podcast and another episode. And I find it quite difficult to admit this because as a, I guess, a a high achieving and a perfectionist, professional woman of a certain age, we like to portray a certain image of ourselves. And I'm going to be quite open and quite honest in this recording about some things that are very close to me. And it's about our guest today and the topic that we will be discussing. Now, Amber Romaniak is an emotional eating, digestive and hormone expert who helps open and motivated women achieve optimal health through mindful eating, self-care and overcoming self-sabotage with food. Her podcast, the No Sugar Coding Podcast, has had a million downloads, over 200 episodes and is listened to in over 88 countries. That there should tell you just how prolific this issue of emotional eating really is. So I welcome Amber with us today. Hi, Nicole. Hi, Amber. Hi, thank you so much for joining me today. This, uh, When I looked at your, your website and uh, your Instagram account um, a few weeks ago when we first connected, I actually didn't think it was possible. And the bit that I didn't think was possible is the self-love bit. And if it was possible to truly... I'm jumping straight in there <laughs> without mm, even yeah. a welcome. But whether it's truly possible to love yourself, mm-hmm. stretch. Sorry, just a minute. Sorry, my phone rang, which is oh, that's to be okay. On. Anyway, we'll uh, quickly we'll start that question again. I'm now on uh, airplane mode. <laughs> I didn't think of that, <laughs> did I? <laughs> it happens. Uh, right. I'm wondering if it's really possible to love yourself. And I'm talking about love your body despite what weight is shown to you on the scales, despite the stretch marks, the cellulite, all the wobbly bits. Mm. Can you really look in the mirror and actually love what you see? Yes, you can. It's something that takes time to build. However, it's fully possible. I actually learned to love and accept myself at my heaviest after I'd finished binge eating. Um, And so it was a very powerful moment for me to see that it wasn't about a number. It wasn't about my body needing to look a certain way. It was a feeling that I dedicated myself to create over Mm -hmm. time because I realized, wow, after, you know, really dealing with intensive binge eating and food addiction for a few years, the fact that I was able to overcome that and that my body forgave me and gave me a second chance was really powerful. And I was like, wow, I'm going to do my part and figure out how to fill this void. Um, So I know it can trigger a lot of women to go, well, I don't love myself. I don't think I'm ever going to love myself. I need to be a certain way. I need my body to look a certain way. Um, But when we start to get deeper into this conversation, there's depths that, you know, need to be explored to help you build the self-love, like understanding why you don't, understanding we've all been conditioned to be critical of our bodies and, and fit a certain mold or you're not good enough, conditioned to weigh every day, conditioned to diet. So when we start to understand the conditioning and working on that, let alone, you know, catching negative self-talk and working on our mindset, we we take small steps that fill the void. Because your story is quite remarkable, really. And you gained and lost over a thousand pounds. And you even interestingly talk about the numerical value of what you ate during that process. And that's something that I've thought about too. And just to give you a little background on my story, I as I said in the intro, like many women of my type, sort of high achieving, straight A type 
uh, women especially, I did slip into an eating disorder in my late teens, early 20s. And thankfully, I was able to uh, deal with the eating disorder. Um, actually, having children was what turned me around and what stopped that. But what I was left with is the body dysmorphia and the fact that I would and probably still do look in the mirror and what I see is probably not what other people see. Mm -hmm. How prevalent is this in women and some men as well? Yeah, it's a very prevalent. So there's a stat that is like 90% of the female population is or has struggled with some kind of body image struggles, unhealthy relationship with food, and it's about 50% for men. So that's significant. So we want to start unpacking, well, why is it that significant and where did it come from? And so honestly, where I find it comes from for a lot of people, number one, your subconscious is fully open from age zero to seven. You're taking in and absorbing everything in your environment, everything people are saying around you. And you create that as your identity. So if you have a parent or parents who are poking at your weight or making fun of your weight or putting you on diets or you know, negatively talking about themselves and their bodies and you know, overeating and then dieting, you're going to take that on unconsciously and not really even realize and make it mean something. And then you have to understand, you know, we're put in front of a television, a, a computer screen, a, a phone now at a very young age, and we see these perfect looking bodies, whether it's on a screen or in a magazine or on a billboard, and we think, wow, these people are successful and famous. So it must be because of their bodies. They have money and fame and have everything they want. It must be because of the way that they look. But there's no disclaimers on any of the posts or ads or shows saying, by the way, we have CGI'd and fully edited this and it is not real. So of course, we in a way, I don't want to say, you know, get brainwashed, but we kind of do to go, wow, like, mm -hmm. If I want to look like this, what I've been taught is I need to eat less and exercise more. And if I can just be perfect on this diet, I'll get this body and then I can live life and be happy. And that is a huge part of, I think, how a lot of women grow up from young girls and we're not taught to, to you know, look at something and go, wow, that probably is airbrushed or photoshopped. We're not taught, you know, to look at self-love we're taught that you cut calories and you burn calories and then you lose weight which is so archaic and couldn't be further from the truth so then you know you have this multi-trillion dollar a year diet industry that is just feeding off of vulnerable women who are so mm -hmm. desperate to like lose the weight i just want to lose the weight because then i'll be happy i want to fit into this outfit that i haven't been able to wear yet and when this is what's leading us it's actually what disconnects us from loving ourselves unconditionally and then puts us into all these self-sabotaging behaviors as you do these diets, you inherit all these rules, restrictions, shouldn't have that, can't have that, that's on the forbidden list. And then when you get stressed out and you fail and you go and you emotionally eat, you stress eat, you overeat, right? Then there's a reaction around that. And then it's like panic, I've got to go back to the diet. So that's, I often find how that whole cycle of some, some kind of emotional relationship with food gets developed is from a young age, your environment, you know, being bullied at school or at home, whatever the circumstances were, and then being just inundated with all this like diet culture and like weight loss culture. It's even you just talking about this really makes my, it, I have a physical reaction. It makes my chest tighten mm -hmm. and it just feels it, like it's so triggered. And I think that um, there there is this societal move and this societal pressure. But just on the weekend, actually, I was watching Friends with my children and I've got uh, one stepdaughter who's 11 and my daughter is uh, nine, going on about 16. Mm -hmm. But um, we're watching Friends and it was the issue of the uh, episode where Elle McPherson comes on and she's the dance instructor and goes to live with uh, with Joey. She was so skinny. And when you look mm -hmm. at Monica and uh, Jennifer, they were so, so skinny. And it does seem that there's been this kind of uh, move, thanks to probably the Kardashians, towards a more rounded body shape. Do you think that that's helped people's or women's uh, body image somewhat or is that creating further issues? 
Honestly, I think it's creating further issues because of the level of plastic surgery and altercations mm -hmm. that these women have had. And now I'm seeing women who are literally becoming addicted to plastic surgery and, and, you know, getting things done to their face and body because it just turns into a whole other addiction. It's like, well, I can die it, but I'm just going to go and get all of these different things done to my body. But again, it doesn't fill the void. And then you can't change your body back to its natural state. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to, you know, judge people if that's what they decide to do your body, your choice. However, it wasn't until that era that, you know, these Kardashians came in that we're seeing all this whole new realm of women coming with all of these things being done. And I, I don't think they're happy. I think that it's just like doing the diet or the restriction, you do it because you think if I can reach this level of unrealistic perfection that I'm seeing on the TV or in the magazine, maybe then I'll be like these people. And so I think one of the biggest problems with modern day societies, we've been taught to idolize people outside of ourselves. And I don't mean in an arrogant way. Self-love is all about having compassion for yourself, you know, treating yourself like a human being, loving, respecting, taking care of yourself. And we've been taught to idolize these people that will likely never meet that we don't know. Um, and if they haven't dealt with their stuff, then they're projecting it on society and their insecurities. And then you have all these young girls who grow up idolizing these people thinking I need to be like that and act this way. And that's how I'll get love and how the boys will love me and money and whatever it is that women want, not realizing that that's not the way that you achieve happiness and that you truly achieve success from a place of love because you can have a successful career you can make all the money in the world but if you're you know shoving your emotions down with food and numbing out of your reality with food or restricting and you're afraid of food and losing control of your body you are not happy you are totally likely in a very inner state of suffering and trying to prove to the world externally that i've got it all together mm, absolutely and i think that what you talk about very clearly is this cycle that you get mm -hmm. into and you will get into this cycle where you're you're eating and then you feel guilty for eating and then you try to starve yourself and of course you can't because then your body wants more fuel and mm -hmm. often i found anyway that it takes something quite big to jolt you back into uh, sort of normality and sometimes you don't even know what the, that normality is so things like getting really ill <laughs> will mean that all of a sudden you can't eat for a few days and therefore your body then goes back to this more normal cravings and, and normal state or um, uh, yeah, just something like that. You almost need this jolt. Is that something that seems to be the experience of other women that you come across as well? This sort of um, cycle and breaking this sort of cycle and they feel almost helpless that they're stuck yeah. inside something. Yeah, it is definitely a very big feeling of hopelessness and helplessness. I find the big jolts for them are not necessarily like having a few days where they're not hungry and, and then it resets them. Um, I find it's really, you know, their symptoms get worse. So their bloating gets worse, their pain in, in their abdominal gets worse, their hormones fail more, they're more fatigued, more brain fog, they're gaining more weight, their sex drives low, they can't get pregnant, their cycles irregular. Um, it's like this accumulation of physical symptoms, which along with the emotional, it, more failure, more disrespect of self, I keep breaking my word to myself because I can't overcome this, more hopelessness, disappointment, insecurity with my body. I'm more irritated and have a shorter like stress threshold. So I'm now, you know, projecting and reacting more toward my partner, my kids, my family, my colleagues, my coworkers. And then you see it impacting, you know, if they have a business, they're afraid to show up because they don't want to be seen because they don't want to be judged. And so they're not going and doing those talks. They're not, you know, expanding their business. They're not showing up and being the face of their brand because they're so afraid of being seen or thinking who's going to think I'm a fraud because I don't look the part when, you know, it's not about that. So people hold back in all these areas of their lives and that is the ultimate cost. And I find what ends up happening usually for the women that come to me and what happened for me is it was that the fear of the unknown of what would it look like if I tried to address this? What would it look like if I could overcome this had mm -hmm. to be put to the side? And it was the suffering that was like, I can't keep doing this. I can't keep going on this path. So the suffering inspired the change. And it's like, I don't care how scared I am. I've got to figure this out. And that's usually what I find ends up happening to these women because 
I find most of the women who are coming to me are, you know, um, have been struggling with this for years or decades, Mm -hmm. and it's really consumed a lot of their lives. And some of them may have even gotten a serious illness or a condition, um, and that didn't even motivate them. So it's to really understand that we don't want to hurt our bodies. We don't want to do this with food. However, the addiction and the pathways that we build in the brain and the cravings and the pleasure response we seek, it just gets so strong that it just feels hard to not do it. And I think that just to illustrate the extent of this, it's genuinely an addiction. And just to give you a, a, a little story to illustrate that, uh, my a, a friend of mine, let's just call her Sally, she would wake up at around 2, 3 in the morning with just these impulses to eat. And she would walk down to a, a local shop that was open 24 hours and buy family-sized bars of chocolate, packets of biscuits, ice creams and things. And what she said to me is that unlike an alcohol addiction where you can just not go grocery shopping or not drink alcohol, not go to Mm -hmm. places where there is, the problem with a food addiction is you have to eat. And so it's incredibly difficult to treat. And she ended up having a gastric band and then had complications and found herself in a whole other set of um, circumstances that was really unfortunate. And that is the problem, isn't it? It is, it's an addiction, a true addiction. It's very, very hard to break. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. And there's many things that fuel the addiction. And that's what I find a lot of people when they get help, they don't realize it's not just like about willpower or trying to eat mindfully. Like the biggest Mm -hmm. part is around your subconscious programming and what you've taken on from a young age and the negative self-talk and, you know, if we're leading from insecurity, so if you're in a perfectionist mindset, if you're an all or nothing mentality, if you're a people pleaser and you're feeling this need to prove because you don't feel good enough, if you don't address those kinds of things, you're not going to gain the full freedom from the addiction because you're overwhelming yourself. You're overbooking your schedule. You're saying yes to everyone else and no to yourself. And when you're in this kind of dynamic, it's really hard to take care of yourself and get enough sleep and nourish your body and, you know, do different kinds of self-care and have healthy ways to cope with stress and build this awareness around your mindset and why you're behaving this way with food. So that's why it's so important to understand that the quick fixes are not going to give you this. And I've had women as well who have come to me and gone, I got the band, you know, done the surgery and it didn't work. And I go, compassion for you. You chose that. However, I'm not surprised it didn't work because you didn't deal with the mindset. Like that's kind of a quick fix to, you know, suppress your appetite level and try to eat less versus going, well, what's, why am I having this behavior? What's triggering me to go to food? Do I feel insecure with my body? Right. Why, why am I in this dynamic? Am I continuing to just diet or am I trying other things? So it's it's so important to understand the root causes for what are fueling the behavior and actually work on those first and build awareness. Because the key with awareness is as you understand why you're doing it, where it's come from, what the triggers are, you can actually start to address them and, you know, gain freedom from them one by one. And, And awareness is something that you only gain more of. You never lose it. So that's Mm -hmm. why the healing and the full freedom is fully possible. And I witness it with the women I work with every day. Um, But we we have to really be willing to do the deeper work. And yes, it takes some time, but then you have freedom for the rest of your life. And so it's important to take that into account rather than just, you know, buying another quick fix and maybe you seem to gain a little bit of progress for a week or two, but then you're falling back into the old habits. The freedom from it for the rest of my life, boy, <laughs> that just seems like an impossible possibility. But your proof that it can work and the clients mm-hmm. that you work with. Now, your your experience started when you were quite young. You were very young when you realized that you were overweight. Is that correct? Just share us with you. Share your experience with us. Yeah. So I didn't really, you know, realize or think I was overweight. It was actually an experience where I went on the bus for the first time. I was five and the older boys on the bus, you know, started to call me ugly and fat and make fun of me. And then everyone on the bus was like making fun of me. And it was mortifying because I wasn't equipped with like being able to brush that off my shoulders and just, you know, handle that. It was me and everyone else. And so I really took on the identity of ugly and fat because I was like, well, if strangers are saying this, it must be true. 
Um, and so I grew up just very insecure. I didn't want to have anything to do with like boys. It just, my dad loves me. That's great. But I don't want to have anything to do with anyone else because they'll just make fun of me. Um, and I think too, growing up with my mom having multiple sclerosis and for her and I, in our relationship, because there's a lot of things she couldn't do because she would get too fatigued. Mm -hmm. Food was something to compensate. So we, everything we did, there was food included. And once I overcame my food addiction, I realized she still to this day struggles with a food addiction and uh, body image issues. And so I just would like observe her always talking about how she didn't like her body being very overweight and just taking all that on. Um, unconsciously and it's not her fault but we do tend to take on habits from our parents if they haven't dealt with them and so I started dieting and you know 10 11 years old you know reading the magazines and going oh well I want to look like this so if this is all I have to do I'll try this obviously it never worked and then the binge eating really hit hard um, in my early 20s I really was just so asphyxiated with losing the weight and having the perfect body uh, and so I really restricted and over exercise, lost weight really fast, got the perfect body, wasn't happy, wasn't fulfilled, became more arrogant, became more nitpicky about my body and more critical. Like I would stand and look at my body and in, in the mirror for like hours and just pick it apart and go, what else can I change? It was just never enough because I didn't feel good enough. And then one day at a barbecue, I was like, oh, I'm just going to eat the salad. I'm just going to eat the salad. And someone brought an ice cream cake and I, they offered me a little piece and I was like, oh, I better have one. So I don't look different. And I ate it and I swear that was just like, oh my gosh, this pleasure high. And then I went to the store on the way home and bought my own and like bin binged on it for the very first time. Um, and then panicked the next day and went to the gym to try and fix it. And of course that really fueled the cycle of, you know, full blown binge eating because I just was like, I can't keep attaining this low weight with the exercise and the restriction. And it's just like this switch flipped and I went way the other way and was binging uncontrollably most days of the week. And my binges were like, until I was so full, I felt really sick. It was just uncontrollable. And I gained about, you know, 60 pounds in four months. And it was very embarrassing for me because then I was the heaviest that I had ever been. And I didn't want anyone to see me. And I hid at home. Aside from my crappy retail job, I just stayed home, didn't want to see anyone. And my whole life just started to revolve around food and trying to gain control with it with diets and restriction, but then completely losing control and numbing out my emotions, my feelings, right? Trying to fill this void with food that would never be filled with food. And so it was a very debilitating time for me in my early 20s to have that experience and not want to date, not want to go out and be social, not want to see my friends. I was broke. Like I had no money because I was spending the bit that I was making on binge food, right. And quick fixes. Mm -hmm. um, and so it was, I was just at the time, like, why am I going through this? This is horrible. I don't know why this is happening. This isn't meant to be my life, but it was happening. And so, like I mentioned earlier, for me, the really, the low point that I needed to have happen was a night that I'd finished a binge. And I was honestly just really concerned that if I kept at the rate that I was with it, that I probably wouldn't make 30 because I was just doing so much destruction to my body. My digestion was just a disaster. I was so bloated and sensitive to everything. I was exhausted, right? Like carrying around 60 extra pounds was not good. I was always in such a negative mentality with myself and you know, after I had binged, I always threw the food in the garbage can because then I knew I wouldn't go and have anything else. And that night I was like, well, I've got to figure this out. So if this is the last time I'm going to do this, there's that all or nothing mentality. I'm going to go and dig through and have some more cookies and like finish this for the last time. And I did that. I dug through the garbage. I ate the food. And then I just sat on the floor and just started to cry because I just thought I just ate out of a garbage, like, who am I? Like, this is horrible. This is such a, a problem. Um, and that really, I needed that to happen though, because what it did is it inspired me to go, I don't care how afraid I am to go on this journey. I need to, like, I want to be here for a long time. I want to have a loving relationship and a family and a career. Um, I, I, this is not where I want my life to keep going. And so it, like literally felt like I was in the front of the Amazon jungle with like this little knife getting ready to go through and, you know, carve my own way. Mm -hmm. Cause I didn't really get help. I didn't have the money, nor did I, I don't know. There's just intuitively something in me that was like, you need to figure this out on your own. And now I know why, because 
I was destined to help others, but I just started to work away at, you know, first was like sugar, reading about sugar and finding out that it was 10 times more addictive than cocaine was shocking to me, but a relief because I'm like, no wonder I can't stop eating it. And then I found out that the, the casein in dairy, which is a protein in dairy and the gluten in the wheat also excite the same part of the brain as heroin. No wonder I start eating this bread or this cheese and I can't stop eating it. So learning about food in itself and how it was impacting my brain chemistry, my blood sugar, my digestive system was fascinating. And so I started to change the way that I ate, not from a place of restriction, but I started to go gluten-free and dairy-free and like learn a lot in the kitchen, which was great because I got a lot more creative with my food. When I realized that it wasn't, you know, the ingredients, the sugar, the dairy, et cetera, were feeling part of the addiction, but weren't the whole thing was when I stopped eating those and still wanted to binge on like bananas in a whole jar of peanut butter or, you know, like make, making gluten-free muffins and wanting to eat them all. That's when I realized that it was this emotional void, this a lack of self-love and I didn't like my body. I was still, you know, putting my worth outside of myself into the number on the scale And that's when I really embarked on the deeper work with my mindset, with starting to catch the negative self-talk, with ditching the scale, ditching the diets, um, building a self-care routine because I realized I didn't know how to cope with stress. So bringing in things like journaling, meditation, deep breathing, gentle stretching, yoga really helped me to start to connect to my body and my mind. And then I started to build awareness around what exactly was triggering me to emotionally eat because if you don't understand your triggers, it's really hard to stop and catch it. So I built this list and put it in every apartment room in my apartment. And, you know, it would be there to remind me as I start started to be triggered. And so as an effect of this accumulation of this journey, the emotional eating started to happen less. And it got to the point where it just stopped altogether. And then from that point, it was really around continuing to build the self-love, learning to accept my body as she was whilst working on balancing my hormones and my digestive system, right? Getting inflammation out of the body. Um, And that took some time, but it was, it just all unfolded the way it was supposed to, because it, you know, from all the stress that I put on my body, you know, she gained all this protection. I like to refer to weight as protection because she just, your body just puts it on when she doesn't feel safe. And so when I was at that peak weight again, even though I wasn't binging, just like, well, what's not making me feel safe? And I realized, well, my cortisol, which is my stress hormone, is like 10 times too high. Wow, I just got, you know, a saliva test back. My progesterone's too low. My estrogen's 10 times higher than it's supposed to be. I'm in estrogen dominance. It's really hard to lose weight when you're there. My thyroid was underactive, right? So I, there was just all of these things that my body's going, I just want you to rest and really like surrender and love me. And so I had a limiting belief that was like, you have to exercise to lose weight or maintain it. But the irony was I was gaining. And this is an important part of the story because for me, I decided to challenge that limiting belief and for a period of time quit movement altogether because it was pushing my hormones over the edge and actually was one of the reasons why my body was continually putting the protection on. Because after I stopped and I really just focused on loving my body, nurturing her, resting her, balancing my hormones and being really gentle with her, it just came off. And my body went to its natural set point without me having to do anything, but really just take care of myself. And I love that that's the way that it unfolded for me because that's what I coach my clients on. And it's so powerful to see their bodies let go of the protection without them focusing on it at all. And it being a bonus effect of doing all of these other things that we've been talking about today. We shouldn't have to force our body into weight loss. It happens as we, you know, make peace with our bodies. Yeah, it's interesting that you talk about uh, the restrictions. So when when you are, say, sugar-free or gluten-free, then your body, of course, you lose weight. But it's not sustainable for, for long term. And there are always going to be certain events that you will go to where someone's having a birthday cake and you feel like you want to be part of that. And you don't want it to derail your whole Uh, your whole journey either so is part of your program about equipping you with the tools in order to uh, not let things like this derail you or do you still believe in say excluding sugar from your diet it really depends on the person so I'm never going to make anyone cut anything out in fact I find that that restriction just fuels more binge eating it's more so to look at it from the angle of if you can't you know, if you're eating this food and you just start losing control, 
in the beginning of the journey, does it make sense for us to instead focus more on like gluten-free alternatives? So it's more swapping out something that has an addictive ingredient or something that's triggering horrible bloating and bringing in something that you can have so that you're actually not restricted at all. And then when you go to the birthday party and the person has the cake, the person gets to decide, do I feel comfortable having that? Does that feel good for me? Or do I actually feel more confident and comfortable not having it this time around? I'm still working on building my food confidence and food courage. Maybe next time I'll have it. So I really leave it up to the person and where they feel comfortable. And if they decide to have it and they they thrive on it, great. That will help build confidence. And if they do decide to have it and then they lose control, then it kind of helps them to check in and go, you know what, maybe I'm actually not quite ready that, to do that yet. Um, but as they gain freedom, they can eat, they can eat the cake. They can go to the party or whatever. It's not about restriction. If someone has pretty severe food sensitivities and we bring in alternatives, usually over the time, the digestive system will balance and they can have some wheat, some dairy, but a lot of people just feel so much better. Um, it's not even about the weight loss. It's about the brain fog goes away. The bloating and inflammation go away. The hormones regulate, the blood sugar regulates. They just love the way they feel. And they notice when they eat those things, it does flare up some of the symptoms. So they still have it here and there when they travel or occasions. However, they really adopt, you know, um, bringing in more of these alternatives at home and they don't feel deprived. And then I have some clients who don't need, you know, to eliminate dairy, dairy or wheat because they never have an issue with it. So it just really depends on the person and meeting them where they're at and making sure they don't feel any kind of restriction. And for those who have really serious food addiction and sugar addiction, sometimes it is about eliminating certain things or minimizing certain things for a period of time as they build confidence and the binging happens less. And for others, they don't need to. So really, like I said, it's up to each person. Yeah, it's... Also, it's interesting, I read once that so many people are so imbalanced that they don't even know what good feels mm -hmm. like. And, but when you're in that cycle and in that sort of self-loathing, it's not about feeling good, it's about numbing, and you raised that earlier, it's about quashing or numbing that and, and almost feeding uh, whatever it is that your body is craving. If, mm -hmm. I guess that's something that you find as well since you're nodding your head. <laughs> yeah. Oh, big time. Right. So we live in a society where we're not taught to feel, we're not taught it's safe to feel. We're taught that feeling is weak or like whatever negative associations each person have taken on with it, or that it's scary. The world's going to end if I sit and feel my feelings. And so we're really taught unconsciously, even like certain shows you watch, like in the show, they're sitting and eating all this junk food, like in the show, in the show, when mm -hmm. the girl gets broken up with, she's sitting there with like a huge tub of ice cream. So all this stuff is getting like unconsciously planted in our subconscious mind without us even realizing it. So th there's that aspect of it as well. It's like, well, it's so normalized to like emotionally eat. Look at these like shows, look at this person just like enabling it and, and encouraging it, which I think is so inappropriate and shame on these companies for doing this because it is not okay and it's not something that should ever be normalized um but when we have this again conditioning that we've all received and we're not taught how to feel and how to have healthy ways to cope with our emotions we go to the quick fixes because oftentimes people are not taking the time so like oh my god i just need something quick to give me a bit of a boost or a bit of energy or to boost my mood mm -hmm. i deserve this i need a reward today was you know not a good day and so people will just create this pattern where they turn on the tv and they numb out with the tv they numb out with food alcohol, smoking, online shopping, like whatever it is, or all of the above. And the more that we do that, the more just numbed out we feel, and we're just shoving those emotions down. And we're not able to pinpoint really how we ever feel physically or emotionally, because it's just something that we're constantly shoving down, shoving down, shoving down. And it, I think it really costs us our happiness to do that. Because Often, you know, times I'll talk to women who go, well, I just, I went on this pill because I didn't want to feel my emotions and I've, I've been really down. So I've gone on antidepressants when it's, that's fine if people have to do that, but it's like, let's address the root issues that are having this significant impact on your mood so that you can be happy and feel joy and be vibrant and have energy and, and not necessarily need to medicate anymore. Like that's completely up to the person, but it's so interesting to see how this journey will pull people so far down 
And again, they don't realize that, that it's these what seem like innocent behaviors that are causing such significant suffering. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the, and you talk about other uh, addictions and that often go hand in hand, such as alcohol and uh, shopping addiction, mm-hmm. which I do that. I, I know I've, I've had Netaport to deliver and I thought, just a minute, where did I, when, when, how, what, what did I do? <laughs> and I would have been in this mindset where I just shopped and ordered something and then it's delivered, which is <laughs> it's a really weird thing that people don't often understand. What, um, what sort of program do you take your clients through for this addiction? Yeah. So when I work with someone, I really want people who are ready to commit um, because it's taken time to get to this point. It's going to take time to change the mindset, the emotional state, undo the old conditioning, balance the physical body and overcome the emotional eating, binge eating, food addiction, whatever it is that you're struggling with. And it takes time for the hormones and the digestive system to regulate and any other physical health complaints that you have. So for me, I I do a one year and a six month commitment with my clients. And within this time together, we're working together very closely. So the first step is really assessing your health and looking at your physical health complaints, looking at your hormone and digestive picture, talking about your relationship with food, talking about your body image, Are you a people pleaser? Are you a perfectionist? Are you struggling with insecurities and unworthiness? And we kind of unpack your whole health history mentally, physically, emotionally, and spiritually for clients who I have who are very empathetic and very much tapped into their intuition. And so then from there, that assessment really allows me to go, okay, great. This is These are the top priorities that we want to start working on and helping you gain relief from. And then from there, the rest of the journey will unfold. So starting to deal with emotional eating and identifying triggers and talking about why those are triggers and providing tools and support to help build awareness around that. Another big part is starting to understand the ego, which is the self-sabotaging mindset, the negative Mm -hmm. chatter in your mind that's going, you'll never gain full freedom. You're always going to struggle with this. You're never going to like look the way you want to. You'll never make that much money. You'll never blah, 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 blah. And you shouldn't try because you're going to just fail again and then you're going to feel worse. So the ego is the biggest part that we work on because that voice is what's been in control for people who I've been working with for their whole lives. And so I teach them how to gain awareness and take their power back so that they can make decisions that are empowering regarding self-care, drinking enough water, getting enough sleep, realizing I'm not actually physically hungry. I don't need to eat. This emotional eating trigger is emotional. It's because I'm tired or it's because I skipped breakfast and now I'm too hungry and I need to start shifting my lifestyle and the way that I run my day to support my body. And so the ego awareness is a big part. And then we also, you know, do work on building a mindful eating routine where you're sitting and eating present at the table. Does it happen every single meal, every single day? No, but it's starting to work toward that because it's important for building that mindful relationship with food and digestion, getting your hormones tested and, you know, thoroughly reviewing those and making recommendations based off of foods, teas, spices, supplements, and lifestyle self-care. Are you exercising too much? Do we need to actually slow that down a bit? Are you overstimulating with too much caffeine, right? It's really looking in depth at all these different pieces and just baby step one step at a time, walking with you every step of the way, helping you to make these changes. And the beautiful thing about working with someone is you really get to understand the complexity of the journey and have someone like pick you up and dust you off when you do have an episode where you binge again or you get into the self-care routine, but then you get frazzled and you throw it out the window again because consistency takes time to build. And so as I'm going along with my clients, everyone is different. However, I'm, I'm seeing women stop, you know, binging or binging and purging or emotionally eating in like two or three sessions, right? So, and when they've been struggling with this for years, so it's significant to see how quickly some can stop and then we can go to the next phase and some women, it takes a year or two to fully overcome the emotional eating, which is totally fine. But the key is they stick with it because they're committed, because they, there's something within them that's going, I need this for myself. And they do fully gain the freedom, which is so powerful to see. And they no longer use food. They can go to the party and eat the cake. They can have things at home and they don't feel tempted. They learn how to listen to their bodies and they do fill the void and learn how to love themselves and realize, wow, I actually don't need to lose that last five to 10 pounds. That was my body doesn't want to be there. And if, you know, they have a larger amount of weight to lose, it starts to come off without them even realizing. And they're going, 
oh my gosh, Amber, like my clothes are fitting so loose, I had to go and get new ones. But it's the focus is not on the weight. It's about getting curious about why is your body feeling so unsafe that she needs to protect. So what's going on hormonally and with the mindset, the behaviors with food, have you potentially suppressed your metabolism, right? Your lack of time mm -hmm. for, to take care of yourself. And that's really the journey we go on instead. Um, so it's a very, very powerful and it's beautiful to witness women taking their power back and then seeing that all of the areas of their life improve their, their relationship with their spouse or they get into a loving relationship. They're more present with their kids and can keep up with them. They're, you know, thriving in their career. They're thriving in their business. They're making more money. They become a manifesting magnet. But it doesn't come from this need to prove. It's like, wow, that feels really good, so I'm going to do that. Wow, that doesn't feel good, so I'm going to set a boundary and say no. So they really embody being in their power. And I think that self-love and learning how to be in our power are the biggest gifts that we can give ourselves because when we lead from that, we have our health in mind. And I think that that's something that we often forget when mm -hmm. we are frazzled and going, I need to prove, I need to like show everybody I'm good enough because I don't feel it. It seems that that health, the health aspect is something that was not at the forefront of my mind, at least when I was younger. Mm. But as I'm getting older and I'm now in my 40s, the health part of it is uh, really important to me. And yes, I, I like to look good in a bikini. And yes, I like to look good when I'm sailing. But I really want to be healthy. Mm -hmm. And again, is that something that you see within your clients as well, this shift as they get older towards the health focus? Definitely. It's definitely a very significant because they are concerned and, and they a lot of them say, I don't end up like my parents. I don't end up like my brother or sister who is struggling with extreme health issues. Mm -hmm. I want to be here to see my grandchildren grow up. I want to be here to, you know, see my kids go through college and, and or whatever the reasons are. And I do find, you know, for some of them, it's a wake up call when someone close to them has something happen. Um, and not that we want that. But yes, that is a very important part. And I think people start to realize, you know, going into the 40s, 50s, 60s, because I have a lot of clients in that age range, that they're not immortal, right? That the yeah. more poorly they're treating their body, the, the worse they feel. Their mental health gets worse. The brain fog gets worse. The inflammation gets worse. Um, the blood pressure, the, you know, the cholesterol, like all of these things get worse. And then they're, they're like, okay, well, what the diets are not working. That path is not working. What have I not tried? That is like really important for me to focus on instead. And that's, I find, you know, where people really will come and reach out because they're just going, I'm done. I've tried everything. Nothing is working. But then I say, well, you've tried the diet approach. Have you ever tried addressing these things from a root cause and doing a holistic approach and 100% of the time the answer is no so it just lets you know again how inundated we are with the diet culture the quick fix culture mm -hmm. controlling your macros and burning calories and whilst maybe that works for a very small amount of the population it is such an epidemic with the the emotional eating and the you know the diet rules and all that kind of stuff that it's it's so important that we we find something that kind of puts a light bulb on her head and goes, wow, I have never thought of that. Maybe that's what I need. It's so consuming, mm. though, having to watch your macros and not just your calories in and calories out, but your macros. And there is just so much that you can track. It must just be so beautifully free just to say, right, no more. I'm not going to yeah. do that anymore. I'm, I'm just going to live and eat and be the way that I'm supposed to be it must just be such a relief for people when they finally get to that and for it you is. it took you five years to get there so this is not a quick fix this is a journey this is part of your life yeah and it is and it's a huge release release for people to not have to have such control because what's below the need to control is the fear and so when people start to realize wow when i start to learn how to listen to my body and i start to sit and eat mindfully and i stop when i'm full actually the counting doesn't help me build any awareness with my body it just keeps disconnecting me and making me obsess and oftentimes people find they have a lot more time on their hands because they're not having to enter every little calorie and thing that they ate that day into their Fitbit app. And so now that more time's opening up, they have more time to do self-care. They have more time to do things that they love because they're not constantly obsessing around food. And I think that's one of the other really powerful pieces of doing this work 
is you not only gain like food and body freedom, but you gain your like mental freedom back because you're not robbing yourself of the present moment, you know, going, wow, like I wish when I went on this vacation that I was, you know, 20 pounds lighter and like, wow, I really regret that I wasn't present with my family on that trip or my spouse. I really, you know, regret not going on that trip and holding myself back because I was insecure about my body. Like you live your life to the fullest when you gain this freedom and your mental clarity and you have more mental space to like think about what you want and be present. And maybe you have then more energy to put more into your, your work or your relationships or whatever it is that you value, you know, aside from yourself. And so to gain that kind of mental freedom from having to think about food all the time and control food and restrict. And then like what you're going to binge on later is huge. It is so freeing. And you also gain so much energy because you're not draining it, worrying and fussing and stressing about the next meal or the next binge. That's right. Because people who are caught in this, uh, a friend pointed this out once. They just said they're constantly talking about food and it becomes this all encompassing, uh, fixation on the food and how are are people uh, dealing with these issues so that they don't pass these on to their their children because that's something that's really concerned me and and you spoke about this right at the beginning and with your own experience with your mother and it's sometimes it's not that you are large as a child it's that you've had that constant Mm -hmm. Uh, talk about oh I must go on a diet or oh, I'm a few pounds heavier and uh, things like that or I must watch what I eat what can we do to make sure we don't pass this on to our children yeah so I think first like a, having have compassion for yourself if this is the the chatter and the behavior you've been in your human you don't know what you don't know if it's happening and you're not aware I think awareness around it and really being mindful of how you speak about yourself around your kids is really important um, if you can try to not pick your body apart if you can try not to talk about your weight diets right oh I shouldn't have that that's bad for me like shame on myself Um, that's the kind of chatter to be aware of, you know, ideally to not go into around the kids. Um, This is the thing, though, is it's not in our full control what their fate is, because as soon as they turn the TV on, as soon as they have access to a phone, as soon as they, you know, get into that world or have friends who their parents are superficial, the friends may make comments. They may have experiences where they're bullied or whatever happens. Hopefully that never happens, but it does. And so it's also, you know, being, building up your kids, complimenting them, getting them to compliment themselves and build self-worth at a young age, getting them to build gratitude about their bodies and their personalities and things that they love about themselves. I think that that's so important, getting them in the kitchen and getting them involved with making good nutritious food and also going, we want to, you know, nourish our bodies and we can also enjoy this baked good and we can sit and really enjoy it and eat it mindfully and then we can move on. I think another key thing for parents and I don't have kids yet, but just things that I observe is ideally not using food as a reward. So if the the child is upset, don't give them candy. If the child skinned their knee, don't give them a treat because otherwise they start associating like when I'm upset, when I hurt myself, when I do bad on a test, like I go and eat this. So, you know, that whole dynamic is important to be aware of. If if you're doing that, it's okay. If you have, you can always stop and shift to like non-food items or bring something else in. But I think that those kinds of things are important because if we start wiring a child's brain, you know, with things like that, they're going to probably take that into their adult life. And that's where stress will trigger them to want reward from food. Having a bad day at work is going to trigger having a breakup or whatever it is. And that is what can really, you know, get the snowball effect rolling and turning into full blown binge eating for some people. Um, So Mm -hmm. I think that that's important. And if you hear your kids chatter about like body image and look at that person, I think it's so important to, you know, maybe show them that a lot of things are photoshopped and edited. And a lot of what we see is not real and to really help them understand that. Because I think if I would have known that at a young age, I probably wouldn't have given so much power away to all this falsehood that we see that just isn't real. Um, And I think that that helps to know that, right? Because now when I look at an image, I'm like, that's totally Photoshopped. Love and light to that person. But like, I I don't give my power away at all. 
And when I am out on the street and I see someone, I'm like, good for them. Good for me. Like we can all be where we need to be. And like, no one is less than like nothing triggers me because I'm not critical and I love myself now, but it took of course time to get there. Right. Yeah, like you just said, with you can be fine with your children and do all the right things. And for me, when I was 12 years old, my friend's mother looked at me in a bathing suit and said, oh, you've got cellulite. You're very young to have cellulite. And that was the first time I had any awareness of my body. And mm -hmm. I went then through a stage, I never wore a swimsuit. And mm -hmm. I never wore a swimsuit in public again, unless I absolutely had to, until I was in my late 30s. Mm -hmm. And that it was that comment that triggered that. What's yeah. interesting now with my children is I then went the other way and ended up with a full six pack and all for my 40th birthday. It was my treat to myself. <laughs> And now my son just two nights ago walked into my room and I had just a bra and jeans on. He went, mom, you've bulked up. What have you uh -huh. done? Where's your six pack? And I just thought, oh no, <laughs> I've now, I've gone the other way with my children. And now he's 13 and he's so aware of bodies and aware mm -hmm. of figures that, uh, yeah, it's, it is very difficult to, um, yeah, to get the balance right and to have the the health focus, but also the attainability and the fact that it's not easy to keep up a body like that. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's a very difficult task. Yeah, and then we have to wonder if 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 that's not attainable, is it even healthy for us? Because I often actually find for most women that kind of um, physique is not good for our hormone health. We're not meant to have that low of a body fat. It's not good for our hormone health. Our cycles our energy levels. And so I do find that a lot of women end up really um, throwing their hormones out of whack by doing that, not saying you've done so, but some women naturally are more petite and it can be a bit more attainable. But yeah, it's really interesting to see some of the body dysmorphia that can come along with women who go and do shows or like get really, you know, ripped or toned, but then they can't attain it. And then it creates more restriction and, and emotional eating potentially and can really cause a lot of negative self-talk and fear of losing control with the body if they gain any weight. Um, so it is it is interesting to see each different women's experience and for each woman to have compassion for themselves. It is a journey. There's no right or wrong. We're all where we're meant to be. And it's just about, you know, are you ready to really go in and gain this freedom doesn't mean you're going to let your body go. I often find the more we love ourselves, the better we treat ourselves. The body just naturally goes to this place with weight and all the symptoms, you know, resolve and we just feel really good. Um, and that's how we should feel. It's normal to feel healthy and balanced. What's abnormal is having all the symptoms and fighting with food. But like I said earlier, it has been normalized, which isn't okay. So it's, it's really to, have compassion for where, wherever you are on your journey. Try to not judge yourself because we're all human and decide, is this something that I want to put more time and energy in and, and am I ready to do this healing work? Because you may not be ready right now. You may be ready in a week, a month, a year, or you may be like, oh my gosh, I need to get on this right now. I want this, right? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, that's me. I've got one last question yeah. for you. I just realized suddenly how, how much time we've spent talking about this. <laughs> Clearly it's a it's a very interesting topic. Just a couple of last questions. First of all, what's your view on all the body positivity uh, influences on Instagram? One of my friends, she says, well, I just think that it's women who give themselves an excuse to not exercise. So what do you think about them? I think that it's refreshing to see women be just open and vulnerable because I think we have just only seen one lens which is the fake edited and that's not healthy I think the key is that people can be authentic at the same time personally I think that you know with this you know I don't think it's positive to encourage binge eating and to say it's totally okay if you emotionally eat every day and eat everything like to me that's not a message that I think helps women feel like ignited and empowered to go and do something about it I don't think we should shame ourselves if we are struggling with you know binge eating or anything like that because it doesn't help us in the cycle but to 
be following people who are enabling it and encouraging it, I don't necessarily think that's healthy either. And I do think everyone is responsible for doing their deeper work and, you know, you're responsible for what you're sharing on your feed. So be mindful in that because you could be negatively influencing someone else and not realize it. That being said, I do think that, um, you know, I don't want to say necessarily that it's a trend, but I think that if our body is excessively hanging on to a lot of weight, how physically are we going to feel optimal? Oftentimes coming with that can come different health issues. To me, there's usually a lot of inflammation in the body. If that's happening, there's hormone imbalances. Like if you're in a pretty decent optimal state of health, you're not going to be excessively gaining weight. You're not going to have a lot of health issues unless you were diagnosed with something, you know, that wasn't tied to emotional eating, which happens, you know, with kids from a young age sometimes. Um, I try to be really delicate and sensitive with this topic because I, know, I don't want right? to judge yeah. or like shame anyone for like that being their path and that's what they're doing. But I really want to question like internally, do they really feel optimally healthy physically, mentally, and emotionally? Are they really happy with themselves? And, you know, is their health really in a good place? Like those are the things that come to mind for me and going whilst maybe they're rebelling and like going, yeah, just like be yourself and like it doesn't matter. I'm always curious to know like what's under that for these people. Mm. Are they really happy? Are they really healthy? Do they really feel good about their bodies or are they concerned about their health? And it's something they're not talking about because now they've created a brand around being mm. this way because I know a lot of influencers, not necessarily pot, bot, body positivity, but influencers who evolved brands around certain eating styles mm. or diets who behind the scenes are like binging and losing control, but because they've, gotten the New York Times bestselling book or because they have such a big following they're like showing up one way on the camera and behind the scenes they're like so miserable unhealthy and like can't attain the eating style but they don't want to pass up the money and and the likes and, and the attention and so that is insecurity too right so we've got to be really mindful and that's that's why I pride myself on my brand because I practice what I preach I'm the exact same person online as I am offline sometimes I show up with my hair frizzy because I'm a fake blonde and I don't want my ends to break off as easily. And sometimes I show up like, you know, whatever, but I love myself. I want to show the best of me, but I'm also not going to the drive through every other day, you know, getting fast food and like just sitting and watching TV and, and punishing my body. And so I think for me, that's really important because I am wanting women to come in and work with me if it's resonant because I can help them and I'm, I'm living in, and, and walking proof of it. Right. So that's a sensitive subject, but I, yeah, I, it is. I do often wonder like what's really below all this for them and are they really happy mm. and healthy? Cause that's the key, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I appreciate your answer. And I think that it's uh, like you say, when someone so quickly gets to a million followers on Instagram, you can see they've, they've really tapped into something that resonates with people, but at the same time, is it sustainable? And, if they were to lose weight, would that still, would it still work for them? Would people still mm -hmm. want to be, uh, would people still want to follow them? There was one final question I wanted to ask you, and you talk a lot about, or you have today spoken a lot about the self-care routine. What does that look like for you? And I understand that's going to be different for every person, but for mm -hmm. you, what does that routine look like? Yeah, that's a great question. And it, it is, it's great because everyone gets to create it to be what they want based on their schedule, environment, et cetera. But for me, um, waking up in the morning, I always do some journaling, some manifestation journaling, gratitudes. Um, I have a tool that I love called EFT tapping, which really works on the subconscious mind. So I'll often couple either both of those or one or the other um, throughout the weekday mornings. Um, and then I usually will have like a piece of fruit or something to eat before breakfast, because ideally we should be eating within a half an hour of waking up. And since I'm doing self care, I want to give my body that little boost. I do a lymphatic routine every morning, dry skin brushing, hot and cold shower, a little bit of rebounding on my trampoline, just because for me, my lymphatic has always been a bit slow. So that really helps my body. And it just gives me energy, makes me feel really good. Um, I always throughout my day, whether I have coaching or I'm doing interviews or whatever else in my business, take breaks, stop and eat mindfully at the kitchen table. That's an important part of my self care. And of course, in the evening, usually spend time just connecting with my boyfriend, relaxing, we talk about our day, express gratitude, 
and it's just like super low key, get out for a walk. On the weekends, I definitely do go into deeper self care. I'll do more meditation. I'll do usually a, a deeper journaling practice, a, a stretching practice, you know, for a, you know, half an hour or so. And we have an infrared sauna. So I will go in there and, you know, sweat and meditate. And just, I find it's a very powerful place to really disconnect from everything and just really um, be present and, and work on manifestation. Cause I find going in, whatever it is about going in that sauna, like we manifest stuff really fast after we sit in there and ask for it. So it's really cool, but that's kind of what my self-care routine looks like. It's, it's really grounding and it's very important that I can be grounded and energized to of course show up for my clients and, and in my relationship and, and just, you know, be in a really good place to, to navigate life. And it's, I think it's so important for people to build and you just start small and over time it evolves and it changes and that's okay. So you don't have to have this big like self-care routine right off the bat. It's just about baby steps. Yeah. I'm just wondering how I can fit that into my day. <laughs> and yeah. it, but it's about making time, isn't it? And we it find is. time for other things. So yeah. Why not us? Yeah, I always say to people, because people often say, well, I find myself scrolling for two or three hours on social media. So maybe I actually do have time and I need to disconnect mm -hmm. more from that and then dedicate some of that time to the self-care. So it's always interesting how when we're motivated to make ourselves a priority, we will find the time, like you said. Yeah, and I think on that, it's if one of our children was really seriously ill, we would take the time to mm -hmm. do whatever it took to nurture them back to health. So yeah. why not for ourselves? Yeah. If we are ill and if we are cutting short our life or our quality of life, just make that time for yourself. It is mm -hmm. so important yes. uh, for your children as well as you. Uh, wow, thank you, Amber. This has been a really insightful and just a, a very interesting dis discussion that I could talk to you about for a very, very long time. So mm. thank you very much for sharing all your insights. And uh, yeah, I'll put in the show notes all the ways that people can contact you. And yeah, thank you very much for sharing what you do. Well, thank you so much for having me, Nicole. I've absolutely loved our conversation today. And like, thank you for sharing some of your story, right? We all have one and it's always just refreshing to hear where someone else is at and that we're not alone. So I appreciate it. And I hope everyone takes one little nugget away from our chat today. Yes, I do too. Thank you very much, Amber.